Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. Fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCB. 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Joining us is uh, an incredible historian and author, and uh, right from the UK, we have Neil Story. Thanks for being on the show. It's a pleasure, Alan. Good to be with you. Well, uh, before we get into the books, uh, tell us a little bit about you. Um, what was so fascinating about history that you've made a life out of it, really? Well, I guess I, I, I kind of grew up an awful lot with my grandparents, and their generation was a very different one. It's one that knew horsepower in the countryside. It knew a slower pace of life. And there was a great storytelling tradition. And as a young lad, you know, you could either turn your mind off or get involved and take an interest and being a curious young chap, I, I loved the stories. I soaked them up. I wanted to know more. And I'd always wanted to hear another tale and meet another one of my grandparents' friends. My granddad was a, a, a real good storyteller, and he had many, many old, old boys used to come in. They had quite horny hands, they had strong fingers, they ruffled my hair, hello boy, how are you getting on? And we'd have a little reminisce, and, and they'd tell their stories, and they'd quite often be a ghost or, or a dark tale to tell as well. That would never disturb my night. I never had nightmares from them, uh, but they give you a little, little chill, or you might look at somewhere a little bit differently, you know, like the old oak tree where a man was supposed to have hung himself, or there was a, a phantom carriage that clatters down that particular uh, country lane at night. So I loved it, and I grew up with it, and I thought, well, with all these guys, you know, when they died, the stories could have died with them. So. I kind of gathered the stories up initially, remembering them or, or recording them. And then I thought, oh, I'll find some more in all sorts of manuscripts and books. I've got quite a large library now and an archive collection. And I've spent the rest of my life writing books and giving lectures for all sorts of audiences, both academic and, and the general public, and, and just sharing my, my love of history and what nicer way to engage people that may be turned off from history than... To, to tell some stories that might just get their interest. Throw a murder in, a dark tale. Throw, th you know, these stories can present quite a dark mirror uh, on, on society in the past. So, yeah, I couldn't really avoid being a historian, I guess. <laughs> it just was meant to be. Mm. Um, so what do, you, what do you think about, uh, just, just touching off on modern times and um, yeah. the way we have... Um, you know, smartphones and and the way the world runs today, it's so um, disposable. I guess is the word. Every you know, people get so much information pushed into them. Yeah. And they have to drop it off because it's a constant flow. And do you think there's still a really big interest in in history with the modern technology, or is that kind of um, interfering? I think modern technology has revolutionized the way we study history. Um, nowadays, you can go online and look at historic newspapers from all over the world. You can get a world perspective on affairs in Great Britain. We can look at the story of, for example, in America or over in Canada. We can find those newspapers as well. Add to that census returns and all sorts of other archives that, you know, at least you can look at their catalogue online. They've often digitised a lot of material. So it, it's meant that, I mean, I, I started, I mean, my first book was published in 1989, so I started before 
the modern digital age. And some of the things that I pondered and wondered about, you, you can just find with a few clicks of a button nowadays. So it, it, I've seen that change. And, it, it, it's, and in fact, if somebody had said to me when I was a kid, you know, you can have a phone that you can carry in your pocket, I'd, I'd have thought, well, how, how the devil, how big is the battery going to be? And you're going to need a huge aerial strap to your back. And, you know, as a kid, you know, you watch these fantasy shows, Space 1999, Buck Rogers, all that kind of stuff. And people are talking to televisions. You know, somebody's face pops up, you can communicate with them. And somebody told me that you could do that on a phone. Oh, come on, a show, you can read a book. And... Guess what? You can also take a photograph. Ah, get out of town, honestly. Get out of town. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is amazing. And it must really help in research. Uh, you can certainly find people and find information that would take a lot longer back even in 1989. Book, Jack the Ripper and the, dark, and the Darkest Sources of Bram Stoker. How, how did you get any information, or how hard is it to get information from 1880s? Well, I think the, the basic story of Jack the Ripper had been pretty well documented over the years. Um, when you look back, you know, there's, there's a, a, a trail that you can... It's, it, I don't think it's ever desperately run cold. It, in the 1880s, 1890s, there were chat books, some of them quite sensational, published. Uh, but with the space of time, and, and let's face it, even into the early 1900s, people were, there were still Jack the Ripper scares. Even if the murder does not fit the, the M.O. of Jack the Ripper, you know, someone being, um, the, the throat being cut and, and the body being uh, eviscerated, it, it would, by Chinese whispers, for example, 1900, it's the Yarmouth Beach murder in Norfolk, a woman is found strangled with a boot lace on Great Yarmouth Beach in the early hours of the morning. You know, the, the sun's up, people are starting to go to work, the, boys, the boy that works at the bathing machines, he found the body. By the time the boy telling the policeman and Chinese whispers through Great Yarmouth, within hours, Jack the Ripper has come to town and ripped a woman up on the beach. That, that's how that, that climate of fear, it, it really did linger. So with that in mind, it's always been an, a case that's remained alive. It's, it's seductive. It's, it's unsolved. And I think people have always looked, are there more than the, the, the assumed five victims of Jack the Ripper? Were there more before? Have there been others since? You know, what happened to him? What, why did the, the horrific murders suddenly seem to stop? When, was it his, did he commit suicide? Or was he captured? Was he put into a lunatic or something? We don't know. Not for sure. There's lots of theories out there. And it's the sort of theories that came out in the 1930s and 40s. And the books have just rolled on ever since. Somebody will follow up a theme, they'll look at the asylum records, for example, back in the day, you know, in the 60s and 70s, when they started to release some of these um, files, you had to go and sit your bum down and, and go and have a look. Then it was, it was hard work, it was a hard slog, but people like Martin Fido, Donald Rumbelow, the, those na the names that resonate from the early days of, of my study of Jack the Ripper, uh, people like Robin O'Dell, they did the, the miles of, of the early, what I call the early modern study of, of the Ripper, people like Dan Farson as well, who was actually a descendant of Bram Stoker, believe it or not. So we, we'll see it develop from the 70s into the 1980s and then in, through the 90s into the 2000s when we start seeing more and more online records that's when you start getting uh, Facebook, uh, not Facebook, but internet groups, uh, message boards, and some pretty fierce dialogue, and, you know, sort of trying to beat out who, who, who is the killer. And the, the, the trouble always is that when, when people have spent hours, days, months, years formulating this theory, and then suddenly a, a piece of evidence comes up that bins that all of that work in effect people will often fight against it uh, so what we're left with is 
you know, it, it's fiercely contested, it's fiercely thought about, so if you are going to come out with a new theory or new suspect, and to be honest, finding a new suspect isn't that difficult. You know, you can find somebody in the area at the time that could well have a, a grudge against, against women or have some sort of mental illness that has driven them to, to commit these murders. Um, so it's really... Will we ever convict him? Uh, I don't think we can do it. <laughs> but I, I think the conjecture is just going to keep on rolling. Why, what's the fascination with people like Jack the Ripper? Uh, what is it specifically about that case and not all mm. the other murders that have happened over the time that it's not only, you see, because it's not only something that people are talking about, but we're still making movies about. We're still uh, writing books and there's still big conversations, you know, was Jack the Ripper a man? Was there just five victims? Was um, the shawl that they that, that was discovered, uh, oh, yeah. you know, it's it's constant, and it's a big stir every time it happens. Absolutely. Why is that holding on, and why are so many people dedicated to it years and years and years later when there's yeah. really no possible resolve to this? Well, I, I think it, it's become a quest. Uh, you know, so there are still people out there trying to find the Holy Grail, so if you are if you are armed with a, a, a case, the, the greatest murder case of all time, then you set that case in in uh, in in the now I'm going to use the term the, the the foggy streets of London. You know the moonlight is there, the gas lamps. That's all very stereotypical. It plays well on screen, and in fact, the truth is there was no fog on the streets of London when Jack the Ripper struck. And, and there were moonlit nights, there were gas lamps, but there certainly wasn't the swirling fog that you see in so many of the films. But, if you think about the image, it's iconic. It's the sound of the footsteps on cobbles, the hiss of the gas lamps. It's, it, if, I mean, everybody I know, at least, you know, they've sat down and watched a film about Victorian Britain. It transports you to a very different time, and I think that's very seductive. Um, there are many romance novels set in that time period. And, and I think some people, people, in fact, people will always be drawn to the darker stories. And let's face it, Jack the Ripper is the darkest of stories of Victorian London in the entire Victorian age. And it's a mystery. And then add on to that some of the suspects that have come forward that popular uh, misconceptions of the story, they, they won't die. They, I mean, the minute that you combine these horrific series of murders with uh, royalty, and let's face it, you know, you, we've, we've had Prince Albert Victor, the Duke of Clarence, you know, you know a grandson of, of Queen Victoria. Uh, the minute you start connecting royalty, well, you, as you will know, uh, Audiences all over the world are fascinated with the British royalty. The, you, you involve them in a murder. My God, I mean, that, that is uber seductive. And then you get a few films going on with a tr a very attractive victims. Only one of Jack the Ripper's victims was in her 20s. That was a girl that is recorded in history as Mary Jane Kelly, a very mysterious character to say the least. But all of the other women, you know, they're, they're middle-aged. And, you know, they were not the bells of the ball. They, they're often <laughs> depicted in films. Uh, these are, and, and something I, I would like to say, Alan, that why, why was there this terror on the street? And it's something people don't often think about. But the East End was incredibly hard up. People couldn't afford to eat properly. I mean, they really couldn't afford to. They're desperate. They're picking food up off the floor. You know, that's why the roads often look very, you'd expect them strewn with rubbish. They weren't. People would be picking it up and recycling it, and they'd certainly pick up food. They would eat mouldy loaves of bread. They would go to um, cake shops. They'd send the children out early in the morning to go and get stale cakes. They would go to the butcher and get trimmings so that they could 
cook something for the old man's breakfast in the morning. There's horrific domestic violence going on in, in the East End as well. It's, it's a horrible, squalid area. But the strange thing is, next door to that, on Whitechapel High Street, you can find some very affluent people who are surgeons. So you've got this incredible mix and blend of people. But those who were hardest up, these women, they were caught, often referred to as unfortunates. And the tragedy is that you, you could be running along quite nicely in life, getting by, but your husband leaves you, or he passes away, you've got children to support, or you've just got yourself into a terrible mess, you're on the street. And, you know, a lot of these women were not regular prostitutes, but occasionally they would turn to it in, in desperation, or some of them, you know, it's, it's a bit like drugs today because they really want a drink, they need that, that fix of a gin, they, they would sell their body to get that, and then spend the night, and probably, they used to call it leaning on the rope, uh, or, you, you know, there's a phrase like a sleep on a rope edge, because you'd, you'd all be packed into a room, standing up, and they'd put a rope across the front of you, and those nearest the rope would hang over that, the rest would hang over the person behind, 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 behind. It was terrible. So, with that in mind, with these women driven to sell themselves on the streets, it struck terror into the hearts of, of anybody there, any woman there, because it could have been them. On that one night when they had to walk the street, it could have been them. So we're talking about a very, very powerful, popular memory, a popular psyche. And of course, anybody going to London at that time my great-grandmother was training as a midwife and she went down to London and she came back with stories when the family were pressing. You know, Have you seen Jack the Ripper? Oh yes, I've seen him. We've all seen him. He, lo he lurks around in the shadows after dark and he his eyes burn like coals of hell and you don't go anywhere near him. So whether they saw him or not, you know, people are coming back with these tall tales. So, you know, with all of that, that autumn of terror that literally gripped London and the rest of Great Britain. If you think of serious murders, they can certainly make people think twice before going out of a night time, even if they're many, many miles away from where that took place. So there are so many factors that, that will mean that Jack the Ripper, his crimes and times, and a fascination in them, will, 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 will they, they, it's going to last forever. It really is. Yeah, I think that it's important to look back at the time and what was going on and what people were feeling and, and, and what life was like. Um, it's so easy to forget, um, you know, before the television. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we don't really, we can't feel possibly what it was like to be alive in 1880 and yes. struggling. And, and it must be... Uh, now and and not only that, I would say Britain was was really known as the the big empire back then. Uh, it was oh, yeah. all over the world. It was the the place of majesty, right? So absolutely, I don't think people realized how poor some lived. They didn't. They had absolutely no idea from the mid nineteenth century when. The, a lot of the major empire building was in place, there were colonial small wars, people were taught this was the greatest empire on earth. An empire so vast they used to say the sun never sets on it, because it's somewhere on the world, around the world, at some point in the day, that there's always sunlight on the British Empire. That's how vast it is. Children going to school are taught the three R's, reading, writing and arithmetic. Yeah. And they are taught every day to salute the flag. And in most classrooms, there would be a picture of Her Majesty Queen Victoria gazing down majestically upon you. And then all of a sudden, these crimes on the east, in the east end of London are splattered across, well, what, what has it, has it had emerged? It was the emerging gutter press. And these were newspapers where... Uh, you didn't need to read them because papers like the Illustrated Police News have lurid depictions of the murders, quite graphic ones. 
that you you could easily access, you could easily see them. Very few of those newspapers survive today because they were made on very friable newspaper, if you ever hold one. Um, they, with time, they've gone very brown and they've gone very brittle, so they disintegrate easily. But at the time also, so many people were fascinated with those pictorial papers, that's why they just fell to pieces with people looking at them. But, you know, you could get a few drinks in the pub if you walked in with the latest news of the Whitechapel horrors. Just a, I, Now, how is it that you tied Dracula, as it were, to um, Jack the Ripper? Well, it, it, it's a very interesting case. I, I'm, I mean, it's... I'm not trying to say that Bram Stoker knew uh, Jack the Ripper, but I think he believed he had an idea who he was. Um, Bram, in all of his books, and you have to remember, he didn't just write Dracula. He wrote uh, Seven Stars, which is the first modern novel, really, that has a, has a mummy as a moving monster. You know, he, that, he has given that genre to us, too. Le uh, he, he was a remarkable man that had been writing for quite a lot of years. And Bram Stoker was the acting manager at the Lyceum Theatre in London, England. He idolised the greatest actor of the day, which was Sir Henry Irving. Sir Henry was the first actor to receive a knighthood, so he was very well regarded. The theatre was, it, it was the highbrow theatre of London, was the Lyceum. And Bram, he, he was born over in Ireland, and he'd given up his career in the, in the civil service to follow the dream, really. He'd, he'd met Sir Henry, well, when Henry Irving was just playing, Henry Irving, on, when Bram was a theatre critic, part-time theatre critic, and full-time civil servant <laughs> over in Ireland. And he was absolutely entranced with him. So he followed the man when, when Irving takes on the theatre, takes on the licence of it, he becomes this remarkable acting manager. Uh, and this was the, he would be the guy that would look after the stars. He would be Mr. Front of House. Bram was a tall, powerfully built man. He had ginger hair and a, and a rich Irish brogue, but with a very educated tone to it. They used to say that he had the smile of Machiavelli and the paw of Hercules. You know, he, would, he was well loved. If you were a friend of Bram, you would be a friend for, with Bram for life, no matter how many years you were apart. Now, through that incredible connection, when all of the great and the good would love to come and see Highbrow Theatre, this, is, this includes people like the Prince of Wales, it includes royal family members, it includes leading politicians, including the Prime Minister, would come and have their box at the Lyceum Theatre. One night... Thomas Henry Hall Cain comes along. Now, at that time, he was just an aspiring author, really. He'd got a few books under his belt. Hall Cain went on to become the first man to sell a million books in the English language. And we've almost forgotten him. I mean, most people have never heard of him, if we're really honest. It's because his books do not really translate for modern audiences. They're often love triangles or quite religious in their nature or quite, quite peasant-like, tales of peasants on the Isle of Man that would be seen as rather trite or twee to modern audiences. But the Victorians, in the same way that they loved a Landseer painting, a sentimental painting of dogs and that kind of stuff, um, they loved Hall Caine. But in those early days, when Bram was this acting manager, Hall Caine is just starting out. Cain writes to Sir Henry and said, look, I'd love to come to a performance, love to see you act. I think he'd seen Irving a few times before. So you can imagine, when two uber fans of one hero meet, both these men adore Henry Irving, admire him immensely, one of two things is going to happen. The two will either get on and become the best of friends, or they're going to hate one another. And Bram and Hall Caine became the best of friends, the firmest of friends, to the degree that they'd go away and stay together. And even when Hall Caine was a dreadful hypochondriac, he lived on Greba Castle on the Isle of Man, 
And even when he, he, Brown was seriously ill in the early 20th century, he, he died in 1912. Just a year or so before he died, Hall Kane is saying, oh, I'm on my deathbed. Bram's ill, but he still makes the journey to the Isle of Man to be by his friend's side. That's a mark of the man that, that was Bram Stoker. So how do we connect the Ripper? Well, it took a lot of years of research and, and, and it took 10 years of waiting because t in, in about, oh, I guess it had been about 1999, I became aware that Hall Kane and Bram were friends and I think not long after that, Stuart Evans, who was a, a remarkable Ripper historian, he's, he's a, a real crime historian, but he's certainly known for his work researching Jack the Ripper and, and, and his discovery of this thing, this letter that has become known as the Little Child Letter, in which it names a Dr. T. And uh, it turns out that this, this Dr. T is Francis Tumblety, the number one special branch suspect for Jack the Ripper. And it turns out that Tumblety and Hall Kane knew one another. Because Tumblety, he was Irish born, but he'd come over to America, he was quite a young man, but, but he'd also gone to Montreal in Canada, and he regularly came back to Great Britain and Ireland. So Tumblety's an everyman, and he would, and why did he do that? Because he would upset so many people uh, where he was, because he had this thing called a pimple banisher, which is advertised in, in Harper's Magazine during the Civil War, which is when he made some, his serious money. But Tumblety, so the story goes, had a, received a, a, a wound, a medical wound through an infection. It's strangely termed, um, or, or, or a medical injury from a woman he describes as his wife, who was a secret prostitute. So it had given him this sexual infection or whatever it was, but it meant that he had a, a terrible hatred of women. And one account even states that he collected specimens of women's uterus that he would uh, display when men came out for an evening meal, had a chat with him. You know, it, these would be his cabinet of curiosity. We at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. It's where he would show how he felt women were so, <laughs> uh, so disgusting. So there is this remarkable link between Hall Kane. When, when he was in, when Tumblety was in Liverpool selling his pimple banisher, and he didn't make friends selling his pimple banisher because this was for unsightly blemishes, skin eruptions, and that kind of stuff. He would publish lists of people he'd supplied the banisher to. Now, if you've got an unsightly blemish somewhere on your body and you don't want the world knowing about it, the last thing you want is the Liverpool Echo to be publishing your name as a list of satisfied clients. <laughs> and Tumblety never learned. He, he, he was chased out of Montreal in Canada for doing the same thing. Various places in America... And then, of course, he did the same thing in Liverpool. But while he was at, in Liverpool, that, it, that is when he met this very young Hall Kane who was working, in a, trying to make his first moves into the literary world. I think he was quite an impressionable young man. And there would be Tumblety, tall, impressive, 
well-dressed. He's got a huge moustache. He's got the lingo. He was known that he could... He had a strange way with people, with the men that he associated with. It was like he had a hold or control over them. Well, the archive of Thomas Henry Hall came was on the Isle of Man. And I made an initial approach there, knowing that there had been a limited... I think there were two or three letters from Tumbleton he had been released and, and sent to, 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 to Stuart, and he included them in his book called The Lodger, it's, it's a fantastic read. But the rest of the archive couldn't be released. And, and I, I, it's, it's not a sinister reason, it's, it's a family reason. It, it couldn't be released because there was family sensitive material in there. So we had to wait. And it wasn't embargo, some people use that term for the whole Kane archive, it wasn't. We had to wait. And it was until a, a particular member of that family passed away. And if I say so much as that that person never knew that they were adopted. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I think that's fair enough to say mm -hmm. that's the reason why. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to name names. I'm sure if you do your own research, you know, you, any, anybody wishing to research, they can, they can pull that out if they really need to. It's not relevant to the, to the bigger story. Uh, the bigger story is that I was the first person to have full access. And in fact, I helped them go through the very last box that they were sorting through. Because, they, because there are letters from all sorts of literary greats, artistic greats. Uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti was a personal friend of Hall Caine. Indeed, Hall Caine was with him, you know, up until the very end. He's on one side of the deathbed. You know, that's how close they were. So it's very, it's bohemian, it's artistic. And in these letters, I, I never expected to find over 30 of them, plus telegrams, plus tumble to using assumed names to send threatening telegrams to Hall Kane when he didn't do what he expected or thought, it, you know, Tumblety would expect him to sell his personal stories and, oh, he, he was a very, very manipulative man. And if Hall Kane didn't do his bidding, then he would get nasty and you can see it in these letters. I personally think that there were more letters. I really do. But what in publishing them, you can see Francis Tumblety's got a real hatred of women. He's got a real hatred of, of, of women of, of the prostitute class. It, it comes out there. And I thought, well, this is going to... People are going to wonder, is, is this the real deal? Because quite often he, he, his handwriting would change. We know that he did dictate some of the letters as well. But I, I was very fortunate to get in contact with Ruth, Ruth Myers. Now, she is a forensic document examiner. Now, that's not a graphologist. She works in modern-day law courts uh, in some pretty serious and notorious cases on both sides of the Atlantic. She's a genuine expert. And I said to her, look, would you mind having a look at these and, you know, is it the hand of the same man? Can a man change his handwriting to this degree? And, you know, if you were presented with these letters, uh, how would you, you know, write your report for the court? And uh, I paid her a professional fee to do that, and that's what she's done. It's, in the, it's one of the appendices in my book, because I knew people with number one question, are these authentic, even though they've been in an archive since the death of Hall Kane in the, in the, in the 1930s. But also to consider the content. Now, and I know that so many people have uh, drawn on those letters because they, you know, they know they're reliable, they have a very, very good foundation. You can go and see the originals in the Isle of Man archives. They're all there. Uh, you can see them for yourself. Um, and, and I think you know, it, 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 it will hopefully be a great foundation to find a man that I think is a pretty damn good candidate for Jack the Ripper. And Bram being so close to Hall Kane, you can see that um, they would have discussed it, and and they would certainly certain Bram loved in, including codes and mysteries and stories in his book, and it's interesting that we know that Bram and Hall Kane were in London at the same time as Tumblety, and if you read your Dracula, you will see that. Jonathan Harker, he, he not spots Dracula in the UK for the first time 
in um, in Piccadilly Circus, which was a well-known uh, homosexual cruising ground. That's why they had this, you know around the statue of Eros uh, in the Victorian age, and it was where Tumblety lived. He, did, he lived just round the corner in Glasshouse Street, and of course Dracula lived just round the corner in a very grotty house too. So that's quite interesting, and, and what is particularly telling too is that in the book Dracula he has the boxes of common earth which is where Dracula can go and hide away and he's planning to do his dirty business in Great Britain and one of the boxes is hidden on Chicksand Street which is in it's in the very heart of the East End and if you look at most of the maps published in the popular newspapers at the time they put the spots on where they believe the Jack, you know, the, the Jack the Ripper murders have taken place. They know the locations, and I think Bram quite easily just put a compass in the middle, draw, drew a circle nice and easily, and went for the went for the uh, went for the road in the middle, and that's Chipsend Street. Because I think Tumblety uh, would have discussed his fears about this 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 man that he was once very close to. You know, you've got to be very clear, careful about what their relationship was. Their letters speak very clearly in, in, in well, they sign affectionately yours. They are intimate letters, but we've got to remember, in the Victorian age, the, nation of, the, the notion of man love was something very different. Um, if, if you've ever encountered Walt Whitman, and I'm hoping I'm sure you have, in Leaves of Grass, he spoke of man love, and, and Bram Stoker was an enormous fan of Walt Whitman. Whitman. He really knew what friendship was. So, I don't think there was a sexual element. Huh. That's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, also, the, the victims, um, it's thought of as, as the Jack the Ripper would be a doctor. So you understand that with Bram Stoker and Hall Kane, they were more than friends. Now it's very difficult to, and not right to use the word that they words or or a description of it being a homosexual relationship in that there was any type of sex involved. I'm not trying to say that at all. What I'm saying is that Bram Stoker knew and understood what man love was. Everybody that was, had ever been close to Bram knew what it was to know his friendship. And it was a true friendship that could last for life. It was quite remarkable. And why I'm talking about this is because when you are that close, you do share intimate stories. You will share you know, when you're spending time together, you're sharing rooms together, as, as Bram and Hall Kane did uh, in, in Edinburgh, uh, look, looking over uh, Princess Street, looking at Edinburgh Castle, and you can imagine it in those days, lit by gas lamps, how eerie that huge edifice would have looked, and how that would have been one of his inspirations for Castle Dracula. And when they were in that room together, the correspondence is quite clear. Hall came wrote back to his, his wife saying, yes, it's been a long day today. You know, this is words to, to the effect that I'm quoting here. Um, he said something like, it's been a long day, and Bram Stoker has been dictating. He'd been reading and speaking and, and thrashing out these wonderful ideas for Dracula, which is why you see a second-hand uh, writing on, on, on the manuscript. Uh, it was never passed to anybody else. They were writing it together. And I'm very proud to say that, I, that that's something I brought that was brand new to the Bram, Bram Stoker table. Thanks to the remarkable correspondence between Bram and Hall Kane. So, when you think about this closeness, they're writing together. 
You think of the, the they used to call it the Beefsteak Club at the Lyceum Theatre, where all the great and the good would go and tell their stories and, and, and enjoy the company of Sir Henry Irving, to enjoy uh, Ellen Terry. To, uh, but as the night went on, Ellen and the women would go, and you'd end up with just people like Bram Stoker, uh, Henry Morton Stanley, uh, Richard Burton, the explorer, all of these people that would uh, bring alive uh, stories of their experiences, their adventures. And it wouldn't surprise me at all that the man, I mean, Francis Tumblety could tell remarkable stories. And maybe he even inveigled himself into the circle of the Beefsteak Club and came on, along on one night. Whether that happened or not is very much speculation. But Bram loved to put codes, mysteries, and, 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 and nuances that his friends would recognise into all of his books. Dracula was no exception. There's still uh, parts of the book we're still trying to break the code or understand <laughs> what Bram al alluding to there. And, and I'm fairly sure that a lot of that, when you think about where Tumblety was staying, when you think about the relationship that Bram had with Hall Kane, you think about the relationship, the intimate relationship that Hall Kane once had with Francis Tumblety. Um, I think it's embedded in the, the word Dracula. And it wouldn't surprise me at all that, you know, if you've had an intimate conversation about a man you suspected could be capable of the Whitechapel murders, you know, an earnest conversation between two men, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Bram Stoker thought, yeah, I've got a pretty good inkling that that fellow responsible for the Jack the Ripper murders. So that chap that the whole cane used to kick around with him. Francis Tumblety. How do we get where uh, we believe, and we hear so much about um, Dracula coming from Vlad the Impaler? Mm. Th this is... Uh, doesn't make me very popular with the Romanian or, or Transylvanian tourist authorities, although there may be lots of people out there, to be honest. I say that with a wry smile. But having read... Uh, and, 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 and discussed the notes for Dracula with wonderful Dracula historians like Elizabeth Miller and Robert 18 Bysang, people I have enormous respect for. And, and having read them for myself, there is no reference at all in any of the surviving notes for Dracula that mentions uh, Vlad Tepes. There is no woodcut or illustration mentioned, and... and Bram was pretty darn good at noting down. Even down, he, he loved language. He made copious notes during his time in Whitby about language, um, local words, inscriptions on tombstones. So if, if he had encountered uh, some pretty serious material about uh, Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Polar, then I think he would have made those notes. He, it would have fascinated him. No, it, it's... Well, it's from his time in Whitby, he came across Wilkinson's Guide to Wallachia and Transphania, and in that he, he found the name Dracula. Dracula was a mercenary, and not a desperately successful one as described in that book. And, and yes, Dracula does mean it's the son of the dragon and all of these interpretations, but Bram didn't know that. You can see quite clearly he liked the name. Up until that time, he had used... Uh, the term vampire, spelt W-A-M-P-I-R. Uh, uh, it would have been pronounced vampire, but vampire, and the, the character was Count Vampire and the Undead. The minute that Bram finds the name Dracula, that's got it. It's got the snap on the tongue. It's, it's so evocative. Of all the characterization he wanted to have, it really worked. So out goes Count Vampire, and it becomes Dra Dracula and the Undead, and eventually, I think it was just a week, if not just days before the actual publication of the book, it simply became known as Dracula. But I'm afraid there is no reference at all in any of the notes to Vlad Tepes. 
So how did that happen? It's an amalgam over the years of people kind of wanting it to be so. There's very good reason to think that, uh, to assume this, because, you, you know, you can find these um, engravings, books in the British Library that could well have, uh, Bram could have seen them. But, you know, I've transcribed the entire library of Bram Stoker that was sold after his death. Now, admittedly, before he died, they did move from one place to another, and he had to downsize his book collection. So we'll, I guess we'll never know all the books that were on his shelves. But again, his sponsors for Dracula are pretty well annotated in his notes. Uh, so there's no mention of, of Pepesh in there at all. So I think it's really through the 1960s, 1970s, uh, this this really rolled on with the with the with the with the Vlad Tepes research because at that time there was nothing really to say. Yes, he knew Bram knew about him, or he didn't. You you couldn't prove it. So you, people were following up this. Who was this character? What's his background? And, and it's a very easy bridge to build. And and one you know as an academic, I respect that, and I I think. It, you know, it, it's a perfectly logical thing he could have drawn on, on this bigger story. But as a historian, I have to say, you know, there's no evidence in the notes for Dracula that, that he did draw on it. Mm. So I hope, that, I hope that's fair to everybody out there, because, you know, you know that's the way I've approached it. Yeah, yeah. And the medical experience that's considered to be uh, attached with um, Jack the Ripper... Do you associate that with t Tumble Tea? Yes, and this is something that I, I personally feel, and uh, again, it's always ho hotly debated, that did uh, Jack the Ripper have medical knowledge? And it's also worthwhile shining a, a sidelight on this, another reason for why a lot of people try and dismiss Francis Tumble Tea by saying that there's no such thing as a homosexual serial killer of, of women. Well, I'm, I'm afraid they do exist. They're very rare, but they do exist. If you read The Sexual Criminal, uh, which was published by an American doctor, in, in, a very well-respected uh, Dr. Rivers, in, in the 1950s, he was examining cases that had taken place in the States, which showed... Uh, violent destruction of, 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 of women's bodies by, by one particular uh, homosexual serial killer uh, that, in a case that he had worked on. And the parallels where you see the, the photographs of those victims from the 50s and the victims of Jack the Ripper, yes, you can see that they are comparable. The difference is that he is being... Uh, he doesn't show any medical knowledge, the, guy, the way this guy is attacking the women. The, the, the cuts, the, the removal of organs, the way he conducts the evisceration of the bodies, this is Jack Ripper, uh, to me, and as someone who's, I, I've worked quite a lot as, in, in this area of medical history, I, I I, and, and I've worked and lectured with those that are both experienced lecturers in surgery and those that are training in surgery. I, I, I do the history of surgery, they do the practical stuff. And, and, and they say, well, look, look at it. They, it shows a systematic opening of a body. Um, he's working in the dark, he's got to work very quickly. And so, you know, in 1888, there were the men examining the bodies, some of them did stand up and say, yes, I believe this shows medical knowledge. I agree with them. And I don't think we can throw away uh, their thoughts and their opinions very easily. And for me, and I do respect everybody's views, because I know there's a lot of passion for the Jack the Ripper case, but personally, I feel it can't be a man from the street. It's a man that shows uh, medical knowledge, and that, that's what I feel. Um, 
it was felt at the time, that's what I believe, and I think that cuts out an awful lot of suspects. It doesn't always make you very popular when you feel that, that way, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think those of us that do believe it shows medical knowledge uh, have that belief on very good grounds. And as I say, it's not something that we're just concocting, it's something that's been thought by those that are hands-on uh, with the bodies since 1888. Yeah, just it, it just leads. There's there's just a lot of bickering amongst uh, Jack the Ripper uh, investigators. <laughs> well, y yes, and and some people, unfortunately, it seems uh, bicker to make a name for themselves, and and I think that's that's rather sad. Um, what I feel is that it's a strong topic. I love to read all the different books that put forward these theories because. Some of them are very outlandish, and you know, others, people have really thought about it. They've looked at the evidence, they've pulled that in together, they've argued with a passion and with some really good research. And, and I, that's, they are the authors that, that I particularly respect. And I think, you know, if people have conducted serious, serious demonstrable research, that they are, they're at least worth listening to. Hear them out. You know, the, the difficulty is that people hate having their theories uh, diluted, disproven, or, you know, something you've held for a very, very long time can very, it, it can really narrow the vision. I think you've got to try and keep your mind open a bit. Yes, focus when you're researching, but keep your mind open if things come along, because... That's the beauty of history. That's, 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 that, it should have a mature forum to, to discuss things and, and share ideas, but in a respectful way. Yeah. What, what have you got planned next? Um, what's coming up for you? Well, for me, uh, I've got a, a very exciting tour uh, of, of Americans coming over to Great Britain. It was by special request. Um, from our friends, um, David Schrader, over at Darkness Radio, and, and the listeners, they wanted to come over and see Great Britain. So we said, oh, OK. And within hours, the thing sold out, and we've had to do two now. So there we are, and I'm really looking forward to those guys and gals coming over. It'll be lovely to welcome them and, and revisit, and visit anew, some of uh, the most fascinating places of haunted and, and grim history in Great Britain. The books for me, well, for the next few years, until 2019, I have a series of books about the First World War that I'm writing. Uh, the next one is a big project looking at the Tommy, which is the story of the ordinary infantryman. It sounds a strange blend, I know, that I've just been talking about Jack the Ripper, but I'm a social historian. My dates are from 1745 to 1945. And the three main strands that I look at are crime, medicine, and warfare. Things that have the most dramatic and profound effect on, on British society and, and have shaped the, the modern world in many ways. You know, you know it, it, those factors made and greatly influenced and changed the course of the 20th century. So they're all strong uh, themes, but for me they are entwined, they're in interconnected, they can sometimes be a result of changes in society, and, and that fascinates me. So yes, social history is, is, is connected on all of those levels, and I, I, it'll keep me out of mischief till 2019, and then I might, I might well look at a return to crime. Uh, I've, I've, I've got some quite intriguing cases that I've been building up over the years. Uh, one thing I do own is the only known hangman's scrapbook, and I own that, and that's safely tucked away. <laughs> Uh, it's for, or, uh, that's for a British hangman. There may be one that exists in the States, but a guy called John Ellis... Uh, was our nation's number one, and this is his very own hand scrapbook with his handwritten annotations in it. It's filled with fascinating uh, light on some of the most infamous cases. I mean, it, 
Ellis is fascinating. He he hanged. He was the man that hanged Crippen, for example, and lots of the early 20th century uh, notorious cases. So, yes, I shall I shall enjoy a, a return to crime in four or five years' time. <laughs> You're just an uh, incredible person to talk to. You, I just love listening to you. And uh, oh, well, it, it's a real pleasure, and, and I hope to join you again sometime and uh, let you know about some more grim tales and, 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 and dark stuff. I hope so. I mean, I, I love it. Um, <laughs> we've been talking with um, the author of Dracula's Secret, Neil Story. Um, thank you for talking with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. To find out more about... To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, yeah. good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.